This video is the second episode in a two-part series for this week's Come Follow Me material. If you haven't seen part one, we recommend that you watch it so that you have context for this episode. The link will be included in the description. If you've already seen the first episode, enjoy. So we've taken quite a bit of time with chapters one and two of the book of Hosea. And what that is, is it's kind of the framework. It's the, the theme that's going to carry through the rest of these chapters in Hosea, where it actually now plays out. All of this story of him and his wife and the three children and, and that divorce and the re-betrothing and the coming back together, it now plays out through the rest of this story with the northern kingdom of Israel. And so there are a couple of verses along the way that we want to focus on, uh, kind of in, a, in an overview sort of a way. Yeah, like some greatest hits, like yeah. some, some highlights. I mean, it's well worth your time to study Hosea thoughtfully and deeply, but we hope that you take the small offering we provide of a few insights uh, to guide your, your study. So look at chapter 3, verse 5, because now it gets back into her, um, not her being Gomer, but her being Israel, um, going out and doing these, these bad things. But look at verse 5, afterward, shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. I love that promise that they will return. He doesn't say, well, we've got our fingers crossed that some good things happen in the latter days. It's, no, they, they will return. Israel will come home. She will be gathered again. And if you go to chapter 4, look at verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel, for the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. Sounds like a state of apostasy. Sound, sounds like they've, they've rejected God, rejected his prophets, rejected the scriptures, so there's no truth. They're, they're now having to rely on the, the composite knowledge base surrounding them, and it's not leading them to salvation. This word controversy is a, also a technical term. It means God is bringing forth a legal lawsuit. And he's going to bring forth evidence of what the people have done and therefore the punishment is justified, right? So the covenant is a legal contract and God is bringing forth the, the contract saying, all right, here's what the contract says. If you do these things, you get all these blessings. If you don't do these things, here's the consequences. And so he's helping people to realize there should be no surprise when bad things happen. You guys signed the contract. I've been telling you over and over, I want you in this contract or covenant with me. And now I have a controversy with you or a legal proceeding. You have broken the contract or the covenant again and again and again. And unfortunately, here are the consequences you're going to have to live with for a while. Yet, the covenant's still available for you to come back into. That's the great mercy here for all of us. Point is that God is always inviting us back so that we can accept his mercy to be in the covenant. Every week at sacrament, the bread and water we talked about, God wants you back in. So do not despair about what you've done in the past. Have hope that if you turn to God, he will cleanse all the pain and suffering that you have caused yourself or other people have caused you. Yeah, so look at some of these, these consequences in, in rapid succession. Look at verse 3, therefore shall the land mourn, and everyone that dwelleth therein shall languish with the beasts of the field, the fowls of heaven, and the fish of the sea shall also be taken away. Remember how he blessed, made a covenant with all those to, to bring forth abundantly? Well, now they're taken away. Verse 7, as they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore, will I change their glory into shame. All of the honors that the world can heap upon an individual can be taken away from that individual quicker than they were added to them in the world in which we now live. Look at verse 10, for they shall eat and not have enough. They shall commit whoredom and shall not increase because they have left off to take heed to the Lord. They're, they're back to this Gomer uh, personal pronoun idea of what's in it for me? What can I get out of this? This is for me and my and mine. And he's saying, yeah, you can go and try to meet all of those needs, but you're not going to have enough and you're not going to have an increase. Uh, it's pretty, pretty sobering. And then look at his wording in verse 16. 
for Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer. Now the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place. It's this backsliding heifer. What, what would that imagery bring up in your mind of this heifer who is now backsliding? If she's gotten caught in a pit or in a, in a muddy mire and you finally pulled her out with a lot of people helping you, you get her out of the, the pit and then she, whether she's afraid or whether she's belligerent or whatever the situation, she backslides, she goes right back down into her pit. And here's Hosea speaking very plainly to the northern tribe saying, you're a backsliding heifer in the way you're treating God. It reminds me of the phrase like, uh, like the dog to his vomit or the, the pig in the mire. It, it just, at what point can we truly reflect on our past experiences and say, you know what? That did not bring me closer to God or join happiness. I'm going to use that reflection, make it a learning moment, apply the atonement of Jesus Christ, and make progress in my life instead of repeating the lessons. Because frankly, they're not lessons if you don't learn, and learning does not happen unless there's change. So God is asking us to change. It's the whole point of repentance. Repentance is just another way of, learn, of, of saying learning. And again, unless there's change, learning has not happened. <laughs> Now, you can, you can try to return to the Lord by the outward things that you do. You can go through the motions, you can check the boxes, you can jump through the hoops, whatever analogy you want to use here, where outwardly it would look like, wow, that person is doing great, they are, they are a righteous, holy person, and actually be completely unchanged because you're not down at the core level of connecting with the Lord with this deep feeling of, I am a child of God, I am a child of the covenant, and I am a disciple of Christ, and I am doing these things outwardly for that inward identity purpose. Look at chapter 6, verse 6, for I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Mm. So if we're not careful, we're going to get so excited about the law of Moses in their context where we, we go completely, 100% all in on performing these sacrifices and keeping all of the feasts and the festivals attached to that law and completely miss the mark or look beyond the mark, as Jacob in the Book of Mormon would say, and miss Christ, miss the covenant connection, miss God completely. He's saying, I want mercy and I want the knowledge of God more than I want these outward things. Now, the outward things are important to do as long as we're doing them in the, the right uh, frame of mind and for the right purposes. Yeah, to, to add to this, I have to be careful how I say this, attending church will not save you. Now, if you're doing a bunch of other like really negative things, you're probably not going to be saved either. What God is saying is that if you're choosing to attend church, and you should take time to build that community and yourself, are you doing it for the right purposes? To increase knowledge of God, to learn about practicing mercy, or really whatever it might be, paying your tithe and offerings. It is great that people pay tithe and offer offerings, but if they simply do it out of habit and without real intent, what's the point? God is asking people, I don't, if we, if we had God you know, talk about this right now, he wouldn't say, no, I don't want you guys, I'm not telling you not to sacrifice and not to do, you know, burnt offerings if you're living anciently. It's make sure that you don't miss the performances for the ultimate purpose of understanding God and spreading his love and goodness throughout the world. So I think it would be important to note that if you are doing the right things but struggling with the right reasons, keep doing the right things. Amen keep moving forward and ask the Lord to help you uh, purify your motives and purify your heart and connect with him and see those things as extension of your relationship with him as, as a child of God and as a child in the covenant. Which now, uh, if we jump over to chapter 11, you get this, this little phrase in verse 1, that uh, Matthew 
in the New Testament is actually going to pick up on. It says, when Israel was a child, when I loved him and called my son out of Egypt, uh, you'll notice how God is speaking about the house of Israel in this context as my son. You, you were in you were in bondage. You were in captivity. You were in slavery, and I called you out of Egypt, and I saved you. And Matthew picks up on this in Matthew chapter two, in referring to just like God brought Israel out of Egypt, He's going to send His only begotten Son into Egypt shortly after his experience with the Magi or the wise men and King Herod in chapter 2, Jesus is going to be taken down, the child is going to be taken down to Egypt, and then God is going to call his son out of Egypt to save all of, all of us. So it's a, it's a beautiful um, foreshadowing for the life of Christ there in chapter 11. And I, I love that you focused on this word loved and this verse, as we all generally understand what the word love means, there's an additional covenantal meaning about how God is in covenant. So anciently, when he took the Israelites out of bondage, it was an expression of his covenantal faithfulness and loyalty to them. He uses the word love, but when we see the word love, we can think about all the beautiful meanings we know and add to it, it's about covenantal loyalty and faithfulness that God himself will be covenantally loyal to us. And by sending his son, jumping ahead from the Exodus time period to Jesus, Jesus is the full embodiment of that covenantal connection with God, that Jesus is the beloved son to show us that God so loved the world. God was so covenantally connected to the world that he sent his son to fulfill and magnify that covenantal relationship. And tied in perfectly with that, is chapter 13, verse 4, yet I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, and thou shalt know no God but me, for there is no Savior beside me. There, there is nothing in this world that can save you. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can do that. Uh, it's beautiful. And then the, the rest of chapter 13 is this story of Hosea again playing out with the, the children of Israel and then the promise in chapter 14 of the last days, Ephraim repenting and returning unto the Lord. Look at verse 4. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. I love that speaking of the house of Israel collectively, jointly, but I love it even more when I picture this being about me and my connection with God and you and your connection with God, that he's willing to forgive us freely and uh, his anger will be turned away from us as well. Uh, powerful story, this, this book of Hosea that often gets overlooked, the book of salvation. The book of salvation, it's worth saying twice. So as we turn to the book of Joel, Again, the name is a lesson. One of the emphases of this book is to teach that Jehovah is God. And if you break apart the name Joel, the Joe refers to Jehovah and El refers to God. Jehovah is God. Now, it turns out, and I really like Joel for this reason, Joel does not spend a lot of time focusing on himself and saying, here's my autobiography and here's where I grew up. Even though those can be very interesting and helpful for us at times, to connect with a, a, a storyteller or an author or a prophet. And it turns out over the years, scholars have really struggled to know much about the historical time period of Joel, when he lived, where he lived. But we have these words that have been preserved over the centuries to invite us to look at what does God do to prove that he is God and to show his hand in our lives anciently and in the latter days in restoring his truth to the earth. Yeah, and Joel is often used as one of the, the sources for looking at some of the signs of the times, some of the events to take place um, previous to the second coming of the Savior. Specifically, chapter 2 and 3 have a lot of them that, that are significant to us as members of the Church of Jesus Christ. If you look uh, in, in verse 2, for instance, of chapter 2, a day of darkness 
and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. And then you get a, fi a fire that devours um, and a flame that burns. Uh, you, you come down, you see a battle in array in verse 5, the earth quaking in verse 10, people running for their lives, um, kind of a, inducing this, this imagery of destruction that's, that's widespread and quite global um, in the second – or previous to the second coming of the Savior. Verse 27, ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God. Are you seeing the theme back to this covenant from Hosea and from previous books as well? Uh, and none else and my people shall never be ashamed. You don't have to hide. You don't have to run. You don't have to, to cover yourself up in, in shame. Verse 28, it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Notice who's doing all of that? That's God who's going to accelerate his work in his own timing, in his own way. We keep doing the best we can down here on the earth to build up the kingdom of God to the best of our ability to gather Israel, but at the end of the day, he's the one who decides when and in what manner and to which group or which individual he pours out his spirit and does these things. This is a beautiful promise that the sons and daughters will prophesy and that the old men shall dream, bring, dream dreams and the young men shall see visions. And also, verse 29, upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit two groups that would have been largely overlooked and not paid much attention to back in the Old Testament time period, and he's including them in here. Notice he, he then goes on in verse 30 and 31, I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. Don't you love how prophecy from the Old Testament can be fulfilled at multiple levels, multiple times throughout history moving forward from that time period? It's this richness of when you read your scriptures and you see how God's word gets vindicated and verified and fulfilled and upheld multiple times in multiple ways through multiple years and experiences. Well, I think about the destruction in the New World when Jesus died and the Nephites and Lamanites experienced a lot of this as well. And sometimes we get fixated on the scary stuff and we spend a lot of time trying to predict it all. And, and I've, I've, for my own self, I've come to the conclusion, what if I spent all that time, instead of worrying about the blood and horror, if I spent that same time figuring out how I can be better at loving God, loving my neighbor, loving myself, because all the time I used to worry about this, it actually didn't make me a better saint or a better Christian. No, you... no I was mostly just afraid and fearful all the time. And I don't, again, I don't think these verses are intended to lead us to fear, but to simply say God has a plan and there's going to be some things that are not going to be pleasant, but that's not how the story ends. It's part of the overall story and there will be a new day where light and goodness reign on the earth. Yeah, I wonder, Taylor, if we spent more time looking at some of these, the, the wonders and the destructions as placeholders or symbolic metaphors to try to figure out what are the, the destructions and the pillars of smoke and the sun being darkened and the moon being turned to blood in symbolic ways in our lives, what are those and how could we then actually live verse 32 more fully. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. It's that idea that we don't need to be looking for the doom and gloom and the destruction in a physical way in the world around us, 
because there's plenty of the spiritual aspects of, of struggle and destruction going on to then say, oh, I'm going to call on the name of the Lord because I need help now more than I've ever needed it before in this world moving forward so that I can stand in holy places and be not moved. So now as you turn to chapter 3, you'll notice in the chapter heading it says, all nations shall be at war, multitudes stand in the valley of decision as the second coming draws near and the Lord will dwell in Zion. Pretty good description, overview that we get here. So you'll notice there will be a, a day, if you look at verse 10, when he says, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears and let the weak say, I am strong. So everybody's going to arm themselves. The whole world is going to be in upheaval and in commotion and, and turning farming implements into implements of de instruments of destruction um, and engaging. Even the weak are going to say, I am strong. Everybody's going to be fighting and there's all this terrible stuff going on. Notice verse 18, it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters, and a fountain shall come forth of the house of the Lord and shall water the valley of Shittim." This allusion back to the vision of Ezekiel of the water flowing out of the temple and healing the Dead Sea and the, the, the deserts around that region. Egypt shall be a desolation, and Edom shall be a desolate wilderness for the violence against the children of Judah, because they have shed innocent blood in their land, but Judah shall dwell forever, and Jerusalem from generation to generation, for I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed, for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. Brothers and sisters, you don't have to live over in the, the nation of Israel. You don't have to go to the the Holy Land to, to fulfill these prophecies. God dwells in Zion. So what is Zion? The Lord dwelleth in Zion? I love Moses 7, 18 when he says, for the Lord shall call his people Zion, for they are of one heart and one mind, dwelt in righteousness, and there was no poor among them. Zion is wherever the pure in heart and the, the consecrated, covenantally loyal uh, disciples of Christ happen to be located, even if it's an individual, uh, isolated, you can still create a Zion where God can dwell with you. We love how you love the Lord and love the scriptures, and thank you for spending more time listening to God's call for all of us to come more closely to him and to be covenantally connected to him. And remember that regardless of whatever else has gone on in your life, there's a God in heaven who loves you and he is betrothing you unto him in righteousness forever. Let us truly say we want him to be our God and we want to be his people. That's our hope and our prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Know that you're loved. And spread light and goodness. Thank you.